On behalf of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, also known as 3CT, I'm the director, Lisa Wedeen, and it's an honor to welcome you and to introduce you today's speaker, my dear friend who also happens to be an exceptional scholar, lucky for me, Professor Nadia Abulhaj of Columbia University. Before getting started, I want to thank 3CT's Associate Director, Anna Searle Jones, for her help in organizing this gathering and for everything she does to make 3CT great. <laughs> we at 3CT <laughs> are also indebted to Ryan Eckholt and to our two student assistants this year, Heather Welty and Delaney Wallace. Thank you to all of you. This is one of 3CT's book salons, and it is an especial pleasure to introduce this book, Combat Trauma, as it is one that I admire greatly and with which I'm intimately familiar. Now, a few uh, remarks about our guest, Professor Nadia Abulhaj. Nadia Abulhaj is Anne Whitney Olin Professor in the Departments of Anthropology at Barnard College in Columbia University, co-director of the Center for Palestine Studies, and chair of the governing board of the Society of Fellows, Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia University. She also serves as vice president and vice chair of the board at the Institute for Palestine Studies in Washington, D.C. The recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including from the Social Science Research Council, the Wenner Gren Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Harvard Academy for Area and International Studies, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. She's the author of journal articles published on topics ranging from the history of archaeology in Palestine to the question of race and genome mixed today to the politics of U.S. militarism. Abul Hajj has published three books, Facts on the Ground, Archaeological Practice and Territorial Self-Fashioning in Israeli Society, University of Chicago Press, 2001, which won the Albert Harani Annual Book Award from the Middle East Studies Association in 2002. The Genealogical Science, The Search for Jewish Origins and the Politics of Epistemology, University of Chicago Press, 2012, and Combat Trauma, Imaginaries of War and Citizenship in Post-9-11 America, Verso 2022, and that's the book that we're going to be uh, talking about today. And as I mentioned the other day at a pop-up event in which Nadia spoke, Combat Trauma is an indictment of U.S. militarism. Taking as its focus the field of military psychiatry, the book illuminates the complex ethical and political political implications of the shifting psychiatric and public understandings of what counts as trauma. Professor Abul Hajj's discussant today is Professor Julian Goh from the Department of Sociology here at the University of Chicago. Professor Goh is also a faculty affiliate of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and a fellow at 3CT. He's the author of numerous writings, including Postcolonial Thought and Social Theory, Oxford 2016, and his newest, Policing Empires, Oxford 2023. In this latest book, Professor Goh examines the militarization of the civil police in Britain and the United States, civil police in quotes, of course. It tracks when and how and why British and U.S. police departments have adopted military tactics, tools, and technologies for domestic use, and it shows how police militarization has occurred since the very founding of modern policing in the 19th century. Militarization, he argues, has long been an effect of what he calls the imperial boomerang. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming both colleagues to this celebratory book event, and goodness knows we need some celebration in our lives at the moment, honoring Professor Nadia Abulhaj and her wonderful new book. Thank you both. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everyone, um, and thanks, um, Lisa, for the invitation. It's my great honor and privilege to participate in this discussion. Um, just a couple things. The book is absolutely fantastic, uh, riveting, um, I dare say, one of those rare books, one of those rare academic books that uh, actually uh, found it hard to put down. Um, uh, and as you know, that's rare for academic books. So um, it's fantastic, and obviously I, I highly recommend you all 
read it. Um, and just a preface to our discussion, um, I'm a, a sociologist, a historical sociologist with interest in empire and post-colonial thought, but I am a sociologist, and so I, I want to make sure that, I mean, my questions might be coming from that disciplinary orientation, and so forgive me if they do. Um, but this book is, uh, has a wide sort of resonance beyond disciplines. So I guess I just wanted to start by um, asking, um, inviting um, Nadia to, to talk a little bit about the book and, and what the main claims and contributions are. Thanks. Thank you all for having me. I feel like I've moved into 3CT somehow. Um, so Anna, thank you for arranging everything again, and Lisa, and of course, Julian for reading the book. It's, it's labor to come up on the book. Okay, so um, I've been really distracted the last couple weeks by obvious things, so I'm gonna try to refocus on this book. So I'm gonna do a short uh, summary of sorts. As the post 9-11 wars ground on, accounts of devastating psychological afterlives of combat became ever more ubiquitous in US public culture. The national conversation about the post 9-11 wars, such as it was, and perhaps still is, has been mediated largely through representations of the psychic life of the American soldier come veteran. The starting point for combat trauma is to ask, with what consequences? What does war appear to be when it is discussed, represented, and grasped, primarily through the lens of the soldier, now home, living with PTSD, at risk of suicide? And what crucial political conversations are elided in public debate and consciousness when so much focus is on the trauma suffered by American troops? And I, I guess I just want to pause and say, in some sense, the book's starting point is also that there's this kind of widespread common sense that the post-9-11 wars have been really absent from the American public domain. And what I argue is, well, they've been absent in, insofar as one thinks about the fighting on the ground and what that means. But if the soldier really stands in for the war, and much more specifically, the traumatized soldier, and that figure is incredibly ubiquitous. Um, think of TV shows, films, literature, let alone journalistic accounts, okay. Combat trauma examines the optics of a powerful and pervasive stand-in for these wars, the traumatized American soldier. It traces shifting understandings of combat trauma in American psychiatry and public culture from the 1970s to today, and it asks, who has the traumatized soldier been, who is he now, and how did he come to be? It examines clinical and cultural practices together with political, ideological, and institutional realignments, and it provides a historical genealogy of the contemporary combat trauma imaginary, as I call it. The argument unfolds through two interwoven threads, a genealogy of the concept of PTSD and its various shifts over the past four decades, and a reading of the ethics, politics, and obligations of citizenship in the post-9-11 era. So I'm gonna briefly begin by briefly summarizing the first thread. I revisit the concept of social trauma, I mean, sorry, soldier trauma in the 1970s, initially named post-Vietnam syndrome, because that was key to formulating PTSD as a formal psychiatric diagnostic category in 1980 when it was adopted in the Diagnostic, diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Reading somewhat against the grain of the existing literature, I argue that it was a radical political concept. Veterans of the war were traumatized by the perpetration of violence on the killing fields of Vietnam. In other words, they were traumatized by what they had done. And healing the self and repairing the world, that is therapy and anti-war politics, were understood to be inseparable. And I just want to say, in the public domain and more in the political establishment and military establishments, I guess, it was understood as such. Psychiatrists such as Robert J. Lifton and Chai Shatton, who were key architects of the con concept, were spied on by the FBI. To talk about post-Vietnam syndrome was understood as a critique of the war. In the 1980s, there was a shift in under to understanding PTSD as a condition of victimhood. Those who suffer the PTSD, in other words, are victims of violence, not its authors. As I show in one chapter in the book, that shift was born of the convergence of various political projects, some conservative and some progressive. And they converged in their need for a concept of a victim, of, sorry, for a concept of trauma that focused on the victim. 
There were feminist demands for the recognition of rape and incest, um, and in fact, for the consequences of race and incest being traumatic. Rape and, rape and incest is a crime that had traumatic afterlives. There was the victims' rights movement and its demand that the judiciary shift its focus from the rights of the accused to the rights of the victims. Essentially, this was a movement, a white backlash against civil rights, the civil rights movement that begins in the 60s and 70s, and it recasts civil rights as a problem of chaos and crime. And finally, there was the conservative reconstruction of the Vietnam War, which began in the 70s and, of course, came to power with Reagan in 1980. Um, through which the argument emerged that if, well, two arguments emerged. One was that the war was not lost on the killing fields of Vietnam, it was lost on the home front. And in relation to trauma, the argument emerged, if Vietnam veterans were traumatized, they were traumatized not in Vietnam, but by the hostile reception they faced on their return. And it's worth remembering that while post-Vietnam syndrome began as both a, a theory of trauma, but a a theory of trauma that was critical of the war, the term Vietnam syndrome came to refer to America's skittishness about foreign military intervention, and that emerges in the 1980s. And this rereading of the traumatized Vietnam veteran, traumatized by his compatriots at home, is of course the origin of the common sense commitment today that one must support the troops, regardless of one's position on the war. By the end of the 1980s, the diagnostic category PTSD no longer had room, not formally at least, for perpetrator trauma. Its iconic figure was increasingly the female victim of rape and incest rather than the Vietnam veteran suffering the afterlives of war. Post 9-11, we see diagnosti diagnostic understandings of PTSD shifting once again. Not all trauma subjects are victims of violence, in other words. Soldiers are often traumatized by having killed, destroyed villages, or witnessed such acts of destruction. Department of Defense and VA clinicians began to argue during the first years of the war. What's more, they argued, existing clinical models that were designed with a focus on victims of crime, I mean, in other words, treatment models, and more specifically, victims of rape, they they were began to argue, are not c effective in treating soldiers returning from war. Their suffering is most often not rooted in being or feeling victimized. The trauma born of being an agent of violence, sometimes referred to as moral injury, reappears here. However, as I argue in the book, in this more recent iteration, it no longer opens up a space for an anti-imperial critique of the war as the notion of combat trauma as perpetrator trauma or a post-Vietnam syndrome did decades ago. In its starkest form, the argument goes, killing is what a soldier is trained to do. He is being injured by doing his job. PTSD then emerges as just one more cost of making war, and treating it is integrated into the institutional structure of military medicine which is not to say it's adequately treated, I want to be clear, and mostly so that one can return soldiers to the front lines as quickly as possible. That is, so one can maintain force protection in the context of a military with no draft. So let me now turn to the second thread that, um, of the book that provides a reading of the ethics, politics, and obligations of citizenship in particular in the post-9-11 era. In tracing shifting clinical definitions and interventions um, regarding combat trauma as they are integrated into the DOD and VA research and treatment protocols, I then also follow them outwards into practices and discourses in the American public domain. I examine the work of non-governmental organizations, often churches and Christian-based charities who treat veterans upon their return. Remember also there's a lot of outsourcing of care, part of the sort of neoliberal transformation um, of the American uh, social net welfare network in general. And I also look at other institutions that work with veterans in projects designed not just to heal their trauma, but to reintegrate them into life back home. In the final chapter, I provide a reading of what was a widespread discourse in the late aughts through about 2015 that speaks of the mili civil-military divide, 
and that generates the figure of the American civilian, although it's gen referred to as the civilian. I want to be clear, it's the American civilian. She who is innocent of war and its evils. She who is marked by the privilege to not answer the call to serve. Note that this is a concept of a civilian, in other words, someone who does not know war, that is only possible in a nation, an imperial nation that can fight its wars so many thousands of miles away. That discourse I show calls upon the civilian to step up, listen to, and care for those who went off to war in their name. It is a discourse that draws on a late 20th century um, notion or discourse of the traumatized subject, their survivor, as witness to truths that the rest of us cannot possibly fathom. Although, of course, the origin of that figure in Western culture is the Holocaust victim. The soldier occupies a much more ambiguous moral space. What's more, it speaks the lang in the language of identity politics, or at least in its grammar. The soldier occupies the place of the injured subject, and civilians, as they are referred to, are called upon to understand <coughs> the apparent truth that only they can know. You who was never there cannot know, to borrow Walter Ben Michael's turn of phrase, and thereby you must not judge. Combat trauma then suggests that the ceaseless demand for public recognition of the traumatized soldier is not an unequivocal ethical good as it might seem to be when measured against the supposed neglect and warehousing of veterans in the aftermath of the American war in Vietnam. The incessant demand that attention be paid, that we must do a better job of listening to, caring for, and supporting the traumatized troops, not only produces these wars as a decidedly American tragedy, to bor borrow Christian Appy's turn of phrase, in helping to attach the American public to the virtue of the soldier as super citizen to whom such deference is owed, I argue, that demand is among the most powerful incitements to American militarism. Thank you. Great. So uh, the um, book is as riveting as the talk. <laughs> it goes much deeper. Um, and I guess one of the, one of the first things I, I wanted to ask you about, and this might be of interest especially to those of you students or younger scholars who are thinking about um, how does one come to a book, how does one come to a project? Because there's no, I don't, well, if you think about the corpus of your work, um, I, it's hard for, to immediately see a natural progression. Your last book was the Genealogical Science, The Search for Origins and the Politics of Epistemology. Your first book was on archaeology. Um, so obviously there are some superficial connections. There's some analysis of scientific discourse. From my perspective, it's kind of a sociology of knowledge going on. Um, but can you say a little bit more about how you got from those to this? Um, and I, I'm just I'm fascinated how, how, how you did that. Yeah, yeah so uh, fair. Totally fair question. I sort of decided to like pretend to be an Americanist for a while. Um, I mean, the obvious threads, and then I'll go to how I actually got to it, are both right. So I'm an anthropologist, but I did a postdoc in the history of science, and, and that it, what runs through each book is a discipline and what you're calling right, the sociology of knowledge, and then the question of how it comes to shape broader political projects, which you know, I've worked on Israel and Palestine, so very much. Uh, colonial projects. But how I came to this project was also much more personal. Um, I, I started, I knew I was going to work on this long before I actually started. And basically, I guess 2004 with the first surge in Iraq, I can't remember if it was four or five, I started noticing that there was an extraordinary amount of coverage in the New York Times and other press that I read of soldiers coming back traumatized. And there were, so, so A, I was already having this sense that we're not really talking about the war, we're talking about Americans. And B, I knew just because I'd done history of science that during the Vietnam, the period of the American War in Vietnam, what was understood to be traumatizing was the fact that American soldiers had gone out and committed extraordinary atrocities. 
But the framing of this was very much in the language of victimhood. Um, people being traumatized by seeing their friends, I want to say comrades, but I know that's not the right word. They're, you know, buddies blown up, being injured, et cetera. So to begin with, I, I could see that shift. And of course, that fit into this larger literature that I knew on, on trauma as victimhood and the rise of humanitarian thinking. But also, I have to say, it was very personal. I, I grew up partly in a war zone. I had not in Iraq and Lebanon, and I spent time in Palestine. I did spend a lot of time in Iraq in the mid to late 80s, because my parents and younger sister were living there. And this was the first time I'd, I'd been in the States for a very, very long time. But this was the first time I'd been on American soil during a sustained war, American war. And it just struck me that there was just no consciousness of what goes on on the killing fields, that it was so absent from this conversation. No sense of an obligation to people who were being killed. And partly, of course, that was the post 9-11 moment where mass hysteria took over American political consciousness. But I think it's much more than that. It, it, it is what is an imaginary of war in a country that has not fought war on its own soil in over a century, right? Um, so that really was the starting point of the book. Great, that makes complete. Oops, anyone? Sorry. Um. Yeah, okay. Um, so this, the larger story you tell is um, uh, really fascinating because I, I can't help but read so much of it, and it's in your talk as a story of some kind of historical transformation or some kind of transformation in discourse, right? That, it, it's really fascinating the way in which you trace out and you, you, you say genealogy, but the way it's actually written is, seems to be, I don't know, less a genealogy than more a story of this live discourse that kind of transmutes and shifts and, and goes in these different directions and, and the two stories that you tell about the shifts in PTSD from sort of experts and activists and then how it enters in the public domain is, is, is one way to think about that, but there's also shifts within those sectors, and you refer to them how, for example, the post-Vietnam syndrome discourse gets turned into the victimhood discourse. And, and again, as a historical sociologist, uh, there's a story here, if not a theory, of change, of, of, of a discourse of change, and you don't like the changes, it seems to be, and we can talk more about that later, because uh, there's a real depoliticization and all these other things going on, but in terms of the change, and how do you think about this, analyzing these discursive shifts, I guess, and, and is it, it, it's not really a rupture, it's, it's some kind of transmutation, and I just really would love to hear what kinds of sort of theoretical tools you employ to think about the shift, or, or how you think about this on a more sort of abstract level, if, if you were to, you know, when you talk to your students about analyzing discursive shifts over time or analyzing discourses and how they enter different spaces. I would love to hear what you have to say about that. So I guess, the, yeah, how do I think about it? I mean, I think this is probably what t tethers this book, although it's really different to my earlier work, mm -hmm. which is that I, I, I do not, I don't, I don't think there's a domain of science, in this case, psychiatry, that is separate from the social world, but I also don't think it's merely derivative of it. So what I, so I think what I try to look at is these, these sort of historical processes, some internal to the discipline, or in this case, a medical discipline, and some internal to American society, and how they kind of both have their own dynamics but intersect in ways that, I, that are not inevitable. Mm. Um, and but that bring about uh, shifts that didn't have to happen, but did. So in this instance, I think, if one really thinks about the shift from the 70s to the 80s, and then I'll talk about depolization, why I'm really not happy about it, but um, <laughs> for other reasons, but um, part of it really is driven by the discipline of psychiatry itself, mm -hmm. right? Psychiatry in the US in the post-war World War II period in particular was very psychoanalytically based. It wasn't strictly Freudian, but it was psychoanalytic. And come the late 60s and early 70s, there's a shift to turn it into medicine, right? And some of that's coming from Congress and the NIMH, which will not fund, you know, basically, if you can't give us diagnostic categories, we're not gonna ensure psychiatric health, right? And some of it is really ideological, which is 
This needs to be a real science. It needs to be like the other domains of medicine. And that means we need, um, sorry, we need less deep ideologies than symptom classes. So we know how to diagnose consistently across time. That changes, and so that, that shift has a huge effect on both an understanding of who a psychiatric subject is, yeah. right, uh, and, and some sense of a political subject, and the, the kinds of treatment protocols that are available, the possibility for even thinking about something like guilt, um, because it transforms an understanding of trauma into either these strict cognitive models or also kind of neurochemical models and increasingly genetic, et cetera. So you have that trend already happening. And then you have this moment of, you know, the end of the war in Vietnam, at least for the Americans, and a kind of, a, the rise of what become the powerful neocons, which is having to rewrite that war so they can reestablish American imperial power in the world. And in order to do that, they have to re-narrate the war in Vietnam. They have to reconstruct the military as a quote unquote a professional military, and they have to, really take on this image of the veteran destroyed by the war, right? But the other thing I just want to say is, but then you also run into surprises, which is, I really didn't have the victim's rights movement anywhere in my head. Like, I knew the feminist movement was involved in this. The historical story tells it so that it's earlier, it's really the 80s, but you have, that's the thing about convergence and accident. Yeah. And in that sense, I think, is why I think it's genealogical, is these feminists who were really anti-Reagan in the most profound way, I mean, the Reagan reconstruction was the reconstruction of the traditional family, end up basically getting into bed with the victim rights movement, although at some point there's a break, because they all are fighting for, the, um, for restructuring the criminal justice system in a way that can recognize, I mean, for feminists, that can recognize rape as a crime, right? Um, and trauma comes in as this piece that helps define define the experience of victimhood. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but the depolitization. I'm going to say one thing about. I did partly go back to the '70s because I I am a little bit invested in saying there's another possibility here, right? Because we sort of get support the troops means. I mean, okay, let me be very clear. I'm not against institutional medical support for people who suffer injuries of war of any sort. Although I'm also not convinced that not every US citizen should have comprehensive. I mean, I'm not sure why soldiers versus the rest of citizens. Um, but that shift also happens in the 80s, right? When the Reagan administration peels back initially the welfare state, it expands, the military becomes its own welfare state. So you have it pulling in other directions. But so much of the literature that today that is being produced about soldiering and war, and we can talk a bit about that because I think what is representing itself, at least in anthropology, is critical. I don't think is as critical as it thinks it is, but it kind of, it's basically, it wants to abandon the concept of trauma as a medical concept at all because it's depolitical. But I, I feel like we have to be able to hold two things at the same time, right? People are traumatized. We may argue with the paradigms and the treatment protocol. And one can yet have a politics and a political critique. And that is my investment in that moment, is we shouldn't have to make that choice. And right. I think a lot of people who've been writing about this are kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater because they only see the discourse as that which normalizes as opposed to that there were other possibilities. This wasn't always what psychiatry was. Yeah. So sorry, I went off on a tangent. No, 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 that's exactly <laughs> where I wanted to go. Because, I mean, one of the things, again, for those of you who read the book, one of the things that um, I really found incredibly compelling and, and illuminating was, I mean, I basically had never thought about the anti-politicization of this discourse. I mean, I, I always thought about discussions of a soldier's trauma as inherently containing a critique of, of the war experience. And I've always thought of it as political, right? Um, you know, I think of Fanon's analysis of, of the, the trauma of French soldiers, and he went from there to an entire critique of the racialized system of French colonialism. I have memories, not memories, I was too young, but I, movies and images of, this, of those veterans on, on, on and, uh, the Vietnam veterans, right, um, on, on the uh, front steps uh, of, uh, was, I don't know which march it was, but veterans are throwing their, um, 
medals, um, and they're telling, you know, saying Johnson is a whatever, a bastard, that bastard Johnson. So it seemed to me, at least from my perspective, that there was always a political, uh, a political charge. But so one of the fascinating things of the story that I found is, is really this exactly this depoliticization or something happening where it loses that charge. And so that was really fascinating to me. And that's what's really intriguing about these shifts. And I guess uh, there's a number of questions I want to ask that. But one of them is, um, as you tell that story, I couldn't help but think about um, the, the power to define. Like, there's a power, you're tracking a way in which this discourse becomes um, a way of defining reality, um, but there are particular social actors involved. And initially, the story, if, if you think about it, uh, the, the power of those early critiques coming from um, Vietnam veterans, right? Um, there's something uh, of a groundswell that, 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 that one can say that this power to define what trauma means and its political charges coming from the ground up. But it seems like the story you can tell, and this is kind of getting at the historical shift, is that really what you see is um, powerful institutions taking that over, right? Whether they be psychiatry or the state, um, and, and later on, you talk about the, 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 uh, the military establishment itself. And so couldn't one read this as a story of an initial uh, potentially uh, highly politicized, highly um, powerful critique coming from Vietnam veterans that then gets kind of, just as all powerful critiques do, get domesticated by powerful institutions? And, and is that, would, that, would that not be a characterization of the story you're telling, in which case there is a kind of inevitability to it. That's true. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious if you could say more about that. Yeah. There is a piece of it that is inevitable. And I mean, I'll go back. And the, and the people who were agitating, OK, so let me back up a little bit. Right, this was also a particular historical moment, right? Mm -hmm. This was the anti-psychiatry movement, right? So even the, the it wasn't just the definition of post-Vietnam syndrome in the sense of what was it that one was traumatized by that was different. It was, right, they, so these, these um, psychiatrists who, got, who were very psychoanalytically bent, or psychodynamically bent, by the way, got involved because they were invited by the Vietnam veterans against the war who were starting rap groups. And in those rap groups, they would all process their experiences in Vietnam and, you know, in deeply political ways, and the psychiatrists were to participate as a member of the group. They wouldn't go to the VA. They thought the VA was, I mean, first of all, the VA didn't even, was often classifying people as schizophrenic and other things, mm -hmm. but um, they wouldn't go. They didn't trust the institutions. They definitely didn't trust, I mean, it's interesting because so much of the work today that goes on among veterans is churches and charities. They yeah. definitely didn't trust religious authorities because, you know, they were the people that they went to when they were in Vietnam, and they were, you know, would bless them to go kill some more people, right? Basically, this is, um, so it was part of this very anti-institutional moment. And there were debates within these groups, and some of these major psychiatrists feared that, so on the one hand, sorry, they wanted to get the American Psychiatric Association to recognize combat trauma, and they wanted a specific diagnosis for what was understood to be an extreme sense of violence, mm -hmm. right? What um, Kai Shatton called uh, the sort of preternatural violence. So being a concentration camp victim, I mean, interestingly, they could bring them together, being in combat of this sort, although they were morally very different configurations. But they also were very self-conscious of the risks, mm. that they knew that if it got taken over, it would just turn into another diagnostic category and a lot of the depth of the critique would fall out. So mm -hmm. they were conscious of that tension, but ultimately felt the cost of not having a way to diagnose you know, tens of thousands of people who were not being diagnosed and were not being treated and the VA didn't recognize it as a formal, right? Mm -hmm. they, that they needed it, but they understood that. So in that sense, I think you're right. It is. Um, an inevitable story, and, and then I, but then I think the other thing is the military now has to deal with it because of a much wider. It's what Vidya Kassan and Richard Refman write about, right? Mm -hmm. The empire of trauma, the way in which you know in the 70s to claim that you 
be a soldier and to be traumatized before this period of time, you're a malingerer. Mm -hmm. There are extraordinary things that, you know, I, I feel like um, I'm not easily shocked, but I have to say, <laughs> when I started digging into some of the feminist literature in the 1970s, we're mm -hmm. talking mid-70s, in which they were still arguing with psychiatrists, <laughs> let alone people in the criminal justice system, who in the, so there were two problems with the problem of incest. I mean, we always, we know women were responsible for rape, right? I mean, that was the argument. But people were still arguing that a seven-year-old raped by her father was somehow the seductress in the 1970s, right? So, okay, I complete, oh, so what they talk about is that transformation from the 70s through the 80s, what Richard Rethman and Didier Fassan talk about, such that trauma is just sort of a given. And I mean, think about it at this point. I mean, it's such an idiom, and uh, particularly in American culture. I mean, to the point where it's sort of, I think, lost any sense of trauma. is like trauma, right? But you go from it being very dismissed to that. So once yeah. that happens, the military has to take it on. Yeah. But there's also the much more structural problem, which is they can't keep drafting people, right? The wars, the post-9-11 wars, they, they were supposed to be quick in and out. They weren't. Over two million people rotated in and out of the, the war zones. And they just didn't have the personnel. And if they kept losing people to mental health collapses, they were not going to be functional. So it really is just the ways in which you treat injuries, it's getting integrated. And I think to even to frame it as a moral question, I mean, I don't mean among the psychiatrists per se, but it's just wrong. They, I mean, and so what's happening is you get shorter and shorter and shorter protocols, which is you take people with massive trauma and can you f take what used to be a 12-week protocol, which was designed by Edna Foa for victims of rape, which is already really short, and shrink it into six weeks because these guys need to go back, like they're military rotations, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's completely institutionalized. Yeah. And then institutionalized in paradigms that are completely not up to the task. Yeah. And that is partly because of where American psychiatry has gone as a field. And it's partly about money. You can't have hundreds of thousands of people in therapy for 20 years, yeah. right? So it is institutionalized, but not necessarily in a way that's providing mm -hmm. adequate care. I want to be clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, and you know, I don't mean to, I want to suggest that, well, so there's a deep historical story, but also, again, for those of you who read the book, there's the wonderful, I think the, the, the second half, you actually do some field work, you observe some meetings, um, I think sponsored by the VA or military churches, um, and um, it's really observing some of this discourse. And what's fascinating is you, you detect these moments where people are speaking, where this politics threatens to emerge, where these real critiques and anti imperial critiques threaten to emerge from family members, from soldiers themselves, and then something happens. Um, and these are just great scenes. Um, this is, I think, the caring for militarism, the chapter. Um, and I don't know, I just could you say a little bit more about that? Because this isn't just a story of depoliticization over time. What you seem to be able to have seen, uh, show us in these observation you're observing, right? You're sort of observing these meetings, is really how the certain discourses or certain ideas bubble up in, in interactions and then suddenly get transformed. And I just, if you could say a little bit more and, and maybe say a little bit more about those scenes for, for, the, for the audience. It's really, right. those are really so, great scenes. Yeah. yeah, so I ended up spending a lot of time, I mean, I went to one formal kind of military VA conference that was training um, the latest techniques in trauma, and that was different. And that's where you get the sort of force protection and money and and in that place you get, you get, well I've been to a couple actually, and in there you get the sense of it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, but nobody's willing to let go of the paradigm. I mean that's the whole thing. It's like an extraordinary thing. If we're gonna tweak it, you know, 50% of people drop out before you even get anywhere. Of those like 10%, I mean the percentages are just failures they can't let go. But the other stuff that I went to ex is, was organized by a lot of, you know, kind of what would be called NGOs in most of the world, charities, many of them Christian-based, but, I, and I say this in the book, and, and to be very, and these are sort of training sessions training for sessions. people in communities, you know, people who are members of churches, sometimes social workers, but not just, just people who are trying to, um, in different ways, interact with 
veterans and help them reintegrate into quote unquote civilian life. And also I went to this theater of war production thing. I went to like three or four of those, which are a whole thing we could talk about. So let me start with the NGO, the, the sort of healing thing. The thing that is, was most important to note is not, this, these were not conservative. These were basically, it's kind of that Christian justice thing, right? If you ask most of them explicitly, did you support the war? On Iraq, they would say no. On Afghanistan, I don't know. They certainly wouldn't have supported it by the time I was going to these meetings. And even in that context, it was impossible to really critique the war. So right, there are moments, mm -hmm. but what was really striking was almost exclusively the only moments of political critique, and by that I mean, was this war legitimate? Was it an imperial war? What was I doing over there? Came from veterans. And there were three or four that, and, and in other contexts, when people would ask the question, we'd always be told, you're here to listen. It is not your job to judge. It's sort of, you weren't there. So part of it is, you weren't there, you don't know. But a lot of it was this demand of deference from the soldier. Yeah. So right, I, I'm not sort of, I do think there's still a profound sense in which when people talk about trauma, there's the possibility of critique. It's shut down by the psychiatric discipline, which has become so scientific, that it's really not, it's trying to, it, you know, psychiatry has been about moral questions for so long, but that is getting shut down, although, although that has sort of seeped back in with people talking about moral injury, although it gets shut down too, because it's perceiving that you did something wrong, not that you did something wrong. But, but that, I think that's what's striking. How does it get shut down and why does it get put, shut down? And partly it's this continuous thing of only 1% of the population serves in the military. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't step up, they're super citizens. But there's also this, and on the left it becomes this notion of a, of a kind of poverty draft. What's really complicated is it isn't quite a poverty draft. It's a class draft in the sense of People, the wealthiest people don't tend to go, but also the poorest people don't tend to go. It's much more of a sinking middle class, or a, and a middle class that has less opportunities. But the, the single most um, powerful determinant of who joins the army is if you have, or the military is if you have family members in the military, right? But there are yeah. all sorts of ways of shutting down that conversation that does pop up. Mm -hmm. And part of what I was interested in is why is it getting shut down? Mm -hmm. And what are the terms, like the, the implicit terms on which it's getting shut down? Mm -hmm. And part of that is this whole question of who serves, and part of it is this identity politics grammar as it meets trauma, which is I can't know someone else's trauma. Only they know it. And so one has to defer. But then one gets into, so what does one have to defer to? Right? right? What kinds of trauma? Like committing an out-and-out -out war crime? killing people in the heat of battle. There's no kind of conversation about that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, certainly. Um, Do we want to open it up? Yeah, yeah, let's, um, I don't, we can just turn to the crowd. I, I think that was most of the questions anyway. So. Are you sure? Yeah. I didn't mean to. No, no, I, 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 I was gonna say it's a good time to, to switch. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Super. Let's Uh, hello, my name is Anand. I'm a first year MPP from Harris School of Public Policy. I'm basically from India. Uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, talk. I wanted to ask that in, if you study the profiles of soldiers from all across the world in various countries, we see that the communities who are from the socially, economically marginalized section, in case of America, they, they are the black population or the Hispanic or brown population in terms of India. There are lower caste people, the Dalits and the OBCs and the Bahujans that we call them. These constitute more than 50%, 60% direct uh, corporal to the mid-level bureaucracy of military. And these are the people who actually face the heavy brunt of war and atrocities associated with it. I wanted to ask that when such soldier, 
who is abandoned socially, economically, culturally, historically, abandoned by his own society, own country, end up fighting a war abroad and commits a kind of violence, also witness a violence. And when he comes back or she comes back, again he face or she face abandonment, exclusion within his own community, within his own society. What sort of a trauma that soldier from that particular race, particular caste, class faces, and also the gender as well, because when women of color fight or the lower caste women who are also uh, serving their uh, work in armed forces in India, how those people's trauma, PTSD, is different than the people who are from different sections of society? And can we actually locate those different markers? Thank you, thank you so much. Because we see this kind of historicity, like the GI Bill kind of supported the uh, white troops after coming back, but kind of institutionally excludes black veterans. So I wanted to understand that aspect. Thank you. Um, I will be honest, the, the, I didn't, uh, some of that is beyond what the book looks at and, and uh, examines. I want to say a few things. One is the, the racial distribution of membership in the US military, actually, it, I'm going to get back to rank, but adheres quite closely to the racial distribution of American society. So in fact, statistically, it is not as true as what is popularly understood. A huge amount of the military basically is the white Trump base, right? Now there are class issues there. Um, it is true that the upper ranks of the military is much more white. The officer class, not the, the, not the non-commissioned officer class, is the officer class. Um, so. I, I think that the conversations that I think have dealt with that, which I've been at at some, uh, not interestingly, or not interesting, interestingly not when I was in the workshops that were run specifically more tethered to the military directly, but in the other workshops, I would say this is the way the conversation is framed which is that people often come to the military deeply traumatized already from the backgrounds that they have grown up in, whether it's poverty or for many people like dysfunctional family abuse, um, et cetera. And that that complicates the sort of trauma of, that you can't always sort one from the other. I think that tends to be the conversation, particularly among social workers and people, less in the VA, I would say, than among social workers, et cetera. So you understand trauma in relation to a much longer life history. Um, I just want to say one thing, though. And again, I, I guess I said it before, but I want to repeat it. The point of the book for me is not to say people don't deserve proper treatment. And in fact, the chapter where I really deal that one, cha two chapters, I guess, for, but one in particular where I really deal with the militaries, both the shift in, right, so only certain protocols can be used if you operate within the DOD or the VA, right? And honestly, they are so, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'll just say it, they seem to me so not up to the task of the deep trauma people suffer. And again, it's partly about a, a American psychiatry believing in these behavioral-based therapies, which are very short-term, do not deal with long-term deep trauma, and in fact are not designed to deal with what's called complex trauma. They're modeled on the idea that it's a single event, and that's what traumatizes you, right? Um, and there's been more money put into mental health, the treatment of soldiers, than ever before. I mean, the Obama, it's a huge amount of money, but you know, millions of people have rotated in and out of these war zones. So for me to make an argument about what it means for an American public to understand or to really, th that the optic for the war is the traumatized soldier and the kind of political and ethical problems that that raises, which is that we never actually ask questions about the wars themselves, we still have not had a conversation about whether the, I mean, 
Iraq was a mistake. Mistake? Iraq was a war crime. I mean, if, if invading a country under false pretenses is a war crime, which we know it is with Russia, it is a war crime and nobody's been called to account. Afghanistan, again, it was like, oh, it was a good idea in the beginning and then it went awry. Really, was it a good idea in the beginning? I mean, we have never had that conversation. And we can't have that conversation. And I think one of the reasons is because this stands in for a conversation of war, about the war, and the complex ways in which the questions that get raised keep getting shut down over and over and again. And this is one trope through which it gets shut down. So I'm really thinking about the figure of this traumatized soldier. I'm not sort of making judgments about their experience or, I mean, I'm making a judgment about, so there are anthropologists who have written books and literally are like, I'm not gonna talk about killing because that's not what they talk about. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I am gonna talk about killing. I don't have to defer to their, I mean, to defer to their nature, that, that kind of a story through their eyes is to defer to a kind of imperial optic, right? So I'm not willing to do that, but I'm also not saying people are not deeply traumatized, and I'm also not saying they're being adequately cared for. I don't know if that makes sense. Lots of questions, so. Um, yeah, I, I, do you, want me you to can field. Okay. I otherwise I feel really so, bad. Uh, Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So my question was about the conversation you were having just uh, a little bit ago about the, the judgment and deferring to the judgment of, or deferring to the soldier and their experience of the trauma. So that was how the kinds of conversations were being, were, were, were being shut down in the sense of we can't critique the soldier's trauma, they can only convey it to us. I was wondering if, um, this, there were any deviations in the sense of the soldiers themselves through their trauma kind of cultivating a critical orientation toward, toward American empire itself? Or, were, or was the soldier's judgment just part of shoring up empire here? So yes, let me answer that in two parts. It's not, the question is not one cannot critique their trauma. The question is, that keeps coming up again and again, is you can't ask so the demand is constantly, a soldier tells you a horrifying, so one of the, the quotes, like, I don't know if I can reconstruct it adequately, but, but I think, so, so uh, this journalist who had embedded with the unit in Afghanistan, I think it was that, and then re-embedded effectively with them back home to see how they readjusted. And one of the stories he tells is of a soldier saying, well there are multiple stories, I'll tell you two. One is, this story, this, this vet now, I guess, or soldier, but I don't know if he'd retired from the military yet, saying, you know, you come home and you try to talk to a civilian, this is their language, and the civilian says, well, we shouldn't have been there anyway. Really? Like basically saying, now, it, we shouldn't have been, it was Iraq, we shouldn't have been there anyway. And that's taken as a critique of the soldier. That's not a critique of the soldier. That could be saying, I'm really sorry you're suffering, and I'm really sorry you're suffering for a war we shouldn't have been in in the first place. It's those kinds of encounters, right? Or, um, I mean, anyway, so there, there, it's, it, well, it's those kinds of encounters, and then there's also the question of uh, another story of a guy who basically talks about having been a trainer in a, in a, an interrogation, well, in a prison in which the Iraqis, not us, were torturing other prisoners and he kind of, how can he live with himself? Again, can I, so the question is also what are the limits? So you can say I understand that you're deeply traumatized by something you did, but I, it seems to me that, that I can't then talk about the war or say, I know it, with the whole language of I honor your service, I don't honor the service. I can say I feel bad and not honor the service or I, you know, it's those things. I'm not questioning the trauma. But the second half, I think, is really important. That's what, I re what is so striking in all of these encounters was the only people that, in, all, in the field work I did, that stood up and delivered critiques and in the language. So there was this very powerful speech by someone who tells this story about being in Iraq and this kid comes up and wants candy. And he doesn't have candy. So he gives him water, he offers him water and the kid doesn't want water and he gets angry at the kid and he throws the water at him thinking, well, why aren't you grateful? And this 
parent or grandparent comes up to save the kid and he says, and I see this fear in the grandfather's eyes and I realize, who have I become, right? And moral injury has become a language that people like him and various people have picked up and, and said, I can't be morally injured, in other words, the idea that I am traumatized because I've transgressed morally, unless I recognize the humanity of the person who I've transgressed against. But those are exceptional speech acts, right? Mostly we hear stories in these thing of, you know, so I shot up, he shot up a family, but it's a story about the soldier, right? But yes, that's where one finds this appropriation and these speech acts. And, and again, it's not, I didn't feel like I was always in a room with nobody that agreed with them, but I was definitely in a room with a lot of people that they can say that, but I can't because I wasn't there. It's that dynamic, right? But yes, there are soldiers and veterans who are speaking in that way. And then that's okay, right? You know, we're all citizens of this country, or not all of us, but those of us that are, they can't be the only people having that conversation. And then what I argue is it's therefore really hard to have a sustained conversation, right, about these wars that aren't, well, it was a mistake, or oh, it was badly run, oh, you know, so many people are suffering. But there's, there's no, so many people are suffering. They're not mostly even here. Um, oh, it's on. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I wanted to ask about the relationship between individual trauma and collective trauma um, and how you sort of see that playing out. And in particular, I was really struck by like the references to like the figure of the American soldier singular. But I was kind of curious to know if that changed, especially around 9-11, when there's sort of this concept of us being like traumatized as a nation and as a group and this collective trauma sort of emerges. Um, but also with reference to like treatment and how psychiatry sort of thinks of cases as both individual, but it seems like there's an attempt to sort of treat collectively as well. So um, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. You know, somebody, I can't remember, I, I don't know, it might have been you, Joe. I can't even remember, but somebody asked me this question late in my writing a book, I was like, oh my God, you're so right. Okay, so think about 9-11. Early on, there was a language of collective trauma. But what's really interesting, if you think about it, is the figure of the family survivors of people, right, you know, all the people who died and their survivors, they have not become incredibly important public and political figures in American society. I mean, think about what's happening in Israel in, con in contrast. Those people are gonna be iconic figures in the Israeli political domain. The, the person that emerges as the, vi the figure that emerges as the victim is the soldier. And I think that that's sort of fascinating. And when somebody pointed out to me, I, I, I decided, I don't know what you think. I think there's a complicated way in which the US cannot really fathom itself as a victim. Right, it was in that period and that got people really riled up and the US went to war, but in some deep sense, I mean, that's my only explanation. It's like the imperial nation is so deep, it can't really fathom itself as a victim. So I think that notion of collective trauma, A, kind of didn't last that long, to be honest. Um, the flip side is on the, treatment, you know, there's no, there's nothing in these paradigms of treatment. Again, I'm not looking at all of psychiatry because I'm looking at what ends up happening vis-a-vis -vis this. It is absolutely about individual trauma. I mean, down to the brain, like, you know, they're also like trying to, okay, so to just give you how, in, I mean, you read the book, how individual it gets. Can we find genetic, you know, the, one of the big moves of PTSD in 1980 was anybody has a breaking point. Now we're back to, are there genetic proclivities? Might there be hormonal balances that lend that way? Um, they're, they're, they're hoping that, they're <laughs> when I was at the um, big military kind of conference at, in San Antonio, they're, they're hoping to, they're working on developing a blood test that could diagnose PTSD. I mean, there's nothing collective in this imaginary. It's about an individual person's response to a particular situation, and it's increasingly tethered to, to back to the notion of some kind of weakness, right? Which is what was abandoned 
in the 70s and by 1980 in the DSM. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there's no, there is no conversation around common trauma as collective trauma. It can be because my buddy was killed, but that's my personal relationship with that other person, right? Hi, I'm interested in the question, I have a question about mass media, because uh, Vietnam War in some ways is an exception in terms of the relationship between military and the journalist. Wait, what is the, uh, the role of the mass media yeah. in shaping the military civil divide you're interested yeah. in, because mass media during the Vietnam War was kind of an exception in my, my take is the uh, kind of exception in American military history because there was no DOD official policy says that the journalist has to be embedded in a unit so the TV guys can show around. They basically has a strange kind of freedom to report what they can and what American civilians actually can see uh, in the television, which is kind of shocking because during the Korean War, the terminology is still shell, shell shock, which is a very military saying, and there is no television, TV reporters can show what the Korean War was all about. And then, during the Gulf War, you already have this DOD official journalist policy that the journalist has to be embedded in a military unit. Mm -hmm. Basically, they are always in a Bradley mechanical infantry unit sticking with a particular group of uh, combat soldiers, which kind of already constrain the journalist's ability to project the imaginaries of war to the American civilians. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the other dynamics, other than the transition from a draft military to a professional military, which might also contribute to the uh, civil military divide you're interested in. So I'm kind of curious to know uh, what are the other tropes uh, more organizationally speaking, like this transformation in mass media, may I also contribute to this shutting down process uh, now you're talking about? So that's it. Okay. Um, so, um, if I understand, right. So let me go to embedding. The fact that uh, journalists could only partake in the post 9 11 wars by being embedded, I think has made an extraordinary difference, right? I mean, literally, we get the soldier's point of view, right? Now, of course, there are, you know, social media is, like, when does it really hit? It's not early on in these wars, right? And then, of course, you have WikiLeaks or whatever. But I think the story gets told and solidified precisely because of the demand. Well, there are a couple demands. You can't show dead coffins coming off the, right? Uh, of American soldiers. I mean, they learned the lesson of Vietnam, and soldiers had to be embedded. As the wars went on, particularly in Afghanistan, there were more um, journalists who ended up having more free reign, but I think there was a way in which that really set the terms of the story. And, and, so, and, it's, and so I actually say at the beginning, you know, I was talking about ethnography. So I did do ethnography, I mean, not what real anthropologists would call ethnography, because I would pop in and out, but I refused, actually, to do research among American soldiers and, and vets, it, it, them being my subject, because precisely what's coming out are all these studies that go inside those worlds of military bases, et cetera, and the story becomes an American story all over again, right? And I think it, it ends up recreating the problems of embedded journalism. So I think those are those that that has really shaped the conversation on the war, and one of the things, and and maybe that's one of the reasons this figure of the traumatized soldier is so central, because also the number of journalists who were with particular battalions in Iraq or Afghanistan who then write about those same soldiers when they return and become veterans, it's like a continuing story because they have these relationships, and there's this extraordinary production of memoirs and, you know, creative nonfiction and whatever that, that are stories of this ongoing um, life. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but. No, but actually, can I throw in yeah. a quote? Oh, sorry. I, I just think about this quote, and it gets exactly to this. I'm sorry to quote you, but it's, I can't help it. <laughs> um, on page 347, you say, in its epistemological conceit, the American soldier's perspective is inherently not only nationalist, but also imperial. In other words, as long as we're forced to see 
from the standpoint of the soldier is, is dealing with self possibility too. So I think that's getting at that opposed to Vietnam where right. you had the images of the right. different images. Actually, can I say one other thing unrelated, which is the term, I, I was using the term the American civilian here talking. I actually decided <laughs> during the, okay, so let me just say, I must have been in interview number 10 with some VA psychiatrist or another, where it's really fine, I mean, I've been in this country for decades, when it finally hit me that when they use the term civilian, they mean Americans who have never been to war. And I was like, I don't use, I mean, I only use that term in the last chapter, because I'm writing about the American civilian, I think we have to stop using that term when we're talking about the war. Americans are not the, the Americans who didn't go to war, they're the public. For one thing, they're citizens. Once you call them civilians as opposed to citizens, you are actually saying they have less authority than the soldiers. But also, it's a way of erasing who are the real civilians in this war. We have to stop using that term to refer to the, like who went to war and who didn't. They're not the civilians of this war, of these wars, period. Sorry, that's my little soapbox that I just had to get on because I was so pissed off at a certain point. And, and part of your point is that perpetrators are made into victims. Right? Yes. That there's yes. that obfuscation that's happening. That that's part of the work that this kind of trauma narrative. But they're victims and heroes at the same time. They're right. not victims the way a survivor of rape is. They, they occupy this ambiguous position of being heroes and victims, right? Which are inseparable. But not perpetrators. But not perpetrators, right. Yeah. Okay, there's somebody in, uh, yes, the person with the glasses, sorry. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks. This is super interesting. I'm excited to read the book. I was thinking when you were talking about the way feminist movement kind of reshaped the discourse around trauma of how this reminded me of, you know, the, the feminist movements have also been involved in reshaping things like abuse and conceptions, hegemony conceptions of childhood or innocence. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I can see how their influence might be traced in the media representation of trauma, but I was wondering if you could say more about the way institu political institutions also invested in this notion of trauma, not just through you know, the succession of wars, but as a kind of active strategic effort, possibly. And I'm sure you have a lot of insights about this. Yeah, absolutely. So let me start by saying one thing. I, the, it's really important not to read the kind of feminists of the 70s and 80s who were agitating for this recognition in the terms of let's say what Wendy Brown calls the injured subject. They needed the category of innocence and victimhood because it was the only way to get this recognized as a crime. And children were absolutely innocent, right? But their position on, it's that famous book called The Right to Be Bad. Their position on rape was the woman is a victim of a crime, but that doesn't require her innocence in every other domain, right? So it's a very complicated and I think much more clear political understanding of victimhood, which is you're a victim of a crime, you have to be recognized as a victim of a crime unequivocally, because otherwise you can't prosecute. I mean, that's why they weren't prosecuting, right? So I think it's also, I just want to be clear, I'm not taking a critical position there. It was part of a political project that was actually quite radical given what they were up against. Yes, the institutionalization is what happens with the convergence of the victims' rights movement and the feminist movement. Because the victims' rights movement, so one of Reagan's first acts of office, it doesn't start with him, but is to, well, I don't know if it's one of the first, but very early in his administration, he appoints, God, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while, a commission on the, um, to study victims of crime. And it's all about, it's A, in a response to the Warren Court of the 60s that expanded the rights of criminals, right? And basically the tenor of that committee is to say, this country has moved so far in the direction of protecting criminals that the rights of victims have been, like victims who are, okay, and then I'll get into it, who are the real, the virtuous citizens are the ones who are getting thrown aside. Now, of course, this was, you know, this had all the kind of whistleblowing of a racial, of a, of a racist state, right? Um, you know, it was all about the streets are so dangerous at this point, no citizen, every citizen knows that they, 
every citizen can be, is at risk for being murdered or raped, right? What's interesting that happens there, I just want to say, is the feminist movement that is agitating for this recognition, including kind of trying to draw, to, to define what initially is called rape trauma syndrome, pulling on the Vietnam, right, is very clear that the vast majority of women who are raped or assaulted are done so by people they know what it's people they know well. It's not the random dude in the street, but the victims of crime movement is committed to that vision of the dangerous urban street with all the racial overtones and undertones that carries. They push really hard to get police departments and the federal judiciary. I mean, it's really a fight in the courts to get institutions, to get the protection of victims institutionalized in the law, what are their rights, but also you know, the whole thing of, you know, now every time something happens, psychiatrists emerge, right? First, what's it called? First aid psychiatrists, not what it's called, but they first come, psychiatric first aid, first, right? Is, comes out of that federal project. At some point, the major feminist organizations working on rape break with the victims' rights movement precisely because they, do, they are not invested in the federal government and certainly not in the Reagan administration in the same way. So it's a very complicated story. Does that help? Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, so Dara in the back. Go ahead. Nadia, I have not um, read the book yet, but Hi, I have bought it, so I like to think I've done the first half of the work. Um, no. I can't tell you how many books on my shelf are, are in that <laughs> state of being. On my book um, it is a pathological affliction. but um, I. I I want to ask a question just um, leading on from Maya's question about, um, about group versus individual trauma. So I don't, like I sort of intuitively, I think it's sort of right to say that um, America can only be a victim in, for so long or in a certain kind of way, but you know, um, it does seem like there's another difference too, which is that in the moment in which we're collectively traumatized, we become more dangerous, not less, whereas when we're individually traumatized, we are, in this theory at least, less dangerous. And so I wonder if you could, like I wonder if it's not so much that America can't be a victim, but that when America is a victim, it's a different, it becomes a different kind of creature, or that the way in which victimization looks is different, or the category of trauma is different. Because it seems like part of what happens when America gets victimized is a repetition compulsion where you just smash the other side with an immense amount of power, whereas the kind of repetition compulsion that's associated with this kind of trauma is different. And so I wonder if it's, like if it's that there's something about when we move from group psychology to individual psychology, we're just operating in a different um, kind of space. I think that's a really good question. but. I, not but, and so let me answer it, re respond to it. I don't have an easy answer. First of all, I wonder, I think that there's a difference between saying the U.S. is victimized and it responds, and the U.S. is a victim. The U.S. certainly was victimized on 9-11, but whether it ever embraced the category of being a victim, I think is different. And, I, and again, I think about this in contrast to the sort of collective psyche right now of, of Israeli society, right? That notion of being a victim is deeply embedded in an Israeli psyche. And it's deeply embedded not just because it's a fact of history, but because the state has done a lot of work to embed that, right? I don't think the response in the US was the same. The US was victimized, and profoundly. I mean, it was experienced that way, but I, I, I still think there is a bit of a difference. I also have to say, and I will be a very unpopular person to say this, but collective trauma, was the US really traumatized? I mean, I also think we throw that word around, like, I mean, it was enraged. I mean, the level of rage and vengeance was extraordinary, but I'm not always sure what we mean by collective trauma, and I think it's become a trope that's incredibly common. What's her name? Ruth Lees has a, like, takes Kathy Corrupt isn't that her name, apart on this question of collective trauma. There, I mean, I'm not saying there is never collective trauma, but I also think that language of trauma can stand in for so much else. And look, do I think there were people, people in New York were traumatized? There, certainly. But this happened at a distance. From, this really happened to New York and the Pentagon, which is a different issue, right? So I'm not sure, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, it was like the Pentagon, well, the Pentagon, you know. Um, I just 
I, I, I'm not as convinced that other than at a rhetorical level, there really was this national collective trauma. But that might just be my cynicism about trauma as a category that is used to capture way too much. Great. Thank you very much for this. Uh,